London, my city. It was a monstrous place. Commerce and trade had made it that way and filled its ever-expanding streets with the rural poor and the new urban rich. Only one thing in the midst of this anarchy could truly be said to be organized, crime. By the 1750s, London's streets belonged to armed gangs. There were a few brave constables, but they faced a near impossible task. Hey! And the lady. I pissed off back to Clark and well. What are you gonna do about it, huh? Oh. But these few brave constables were simply overwhelmed, and they needed help. To this end, I devised a proposal to Parliament to remedy this growing evil. I turned my attention from my celebrated works of fiction and accepted the post of Magistrate of Westminster. And with my brother John, blind since youth, I resolved to create a new organization that would bring law and order to the city's streets. London was in need of a police force. night watchmen and thief takers, but they were deeply corrupt. To create an effective police force, I needed money, and I needed sponsors in Parliament. We hoped to have found such a patron in Lord Newcastle. brother has performed the most exhaustive calculations, and we require merely 500 pounds to employ six men. With such a force, we can crush forever these gangs that infest our streets. Even six men will be considered a police force, Mr. Fielding, and Parliament is unlikely to regard it with enthusiasm. The very idea remains foreign to the English temperament. Well, indeed, we make sure not to call them police. Our proposals to Parliament in detail, my lord. Oh, ah, as luck would have it, here is Mr. Saunders. <laughs> Which family of shit sacks spawned this one? Moody yet again, Mr. Fielding. Assaulting a gentleman and his good wife not two streets off. I never heard of the Moody yet. Nicholas Mooney. Perfect example. Absolutely the vilest man that ever wore a head, and yet unhindered in his foul, violent work. Observe our predicament, Mr. Saunders Welsh. The most trustworthy man in London and a master craftsman with his fist. He is not enough. Six men the like of Mr. Welch. With just six, we can make a beginning. Hmm, gentlemen, the most interesting discussion. And I have no wish to curtail it. It would afford me the most immense pleasure if you'd be my guest. Oh, that's most generous, sir. Sling the bog lander in the compter. <laughs> Discuss him in the morning. We knew what Newcastle meant. Covent Garden heaved with brothels. Indeed, there was one right next door to my house. <sighs> Some felt it worth braving the embattled thoroughfares to reach Pall Mall, where the most exclusive brothel was to be found, the Temples of Venus. Are you acquainted with Mrs. Falkland? No, it's a pleasure we've hitherto been denied. Mm. Sir? <clears throat> 
My lord Newcastle. A pleasure, as always. Mess. You must know my guests, who have most generously escorted me through these perilous streets. Mr. Henry, Mr. John Fielding. How delightful. The magistrates of Westminster. Madam. Madam. Can I offer you tea or wine? What a bottle of port, Fielding. They have the finest in London. You just late arrived on a ship from Lisbon. And so immediately you discover my weakness. <laughs> there are two temples here, one for the younger ladies, the other for those who have learned to cater for more specialised tastes. A tour is surely in order, Mrs. Faulkner. Mm. Oh. It would be my most ardent pleasure. Well, then, um, it would be ours. Do you require assistance, Mr. Field? No, thank you. I am perfectly mobile. Very well. Let's take a walk. This most delightful of creatures. Susanna White, my lord. People call me Suki, sir. Mrs. Falkland, I trust Suki is new to your house and you haven't been hiding her from me. <laughs> Not hiding, saving. These are my renowned guests. Mr. Henry Fielding is also the greatest writer in England. The master of stage and the printed page alike. And my lord is endlessly kind. Well, perhaps madame will be generous and lend me some of his writings so as I can improve myself. <sighs> Speak presently. Gentlemen, such <laughs> close friends of Lord Newcastle are, of course, welcome to visit any time. Thomas Pelham Hollis, first Duke of Newcastle, wasn't just another politician. He was the brother of the Prime Minister, and the future Prime Minister himself. We remained confident that he was indeed our ally in this matter. No, no, in a year we should uh, petition for more. Oh, just think what marvels we will have accomplished in a year. You look tired, Mr. Fielding. It would do you good not to stay up all night. Yes, yes. So Every day from Hackney, when my father works the orchards there. We were um, selling apples when one of Mrs. Falkland's people saw us. And offered you employment? Last Thursday. Look, my father don't earn much. Most of what he does earn, he spends on ale. My mother's dead. God rest her soul. So, Mrs. Falkland's offer was a stroke of remarkable good fortune. I sent her home. My sister, I sent her home. But a bully in Mrs. Falkland's employment must have snatched her somewhere on the road. No sooner was I given food and clothing at the temple did I discover that my sister was there too. Mr. Fiddich. For all I know, they've 
deflowered her already. I imagine the sale of apples was not the extent of your prior experience. In the name of God, sir. In the name of God. Polly's not quite seven years old. Mr. Fielding, you have some property here of mine. Those pretty clothes on your back belong to me, Susanna. A dress made specially for you cost me ten shillings, skirts and petticoats, eight and six. The hat was four, the shoes with buckles, eight shillings. Oh, of course you know the law. Of course he knows the law, he's a magistrate. Mary. Then you must agree the girl's a thief. Either throw her in the compter, arrange for her hanging, or see to which she returns with me. Mr. Fairdale. Seems you best return with Mrs. Falkland. <laughs> the devil fuck you, Mr. Fielding. <laughs> I heard you might be more difficult than your predecessors, but I see you are a most reasonable man. In all things. I don't know what you earn from your novels, Mr. Fielding, but I am sure the office of magistrate is less than serious lucrative without the beneficence of patrons. We share many patrons, I have no doubt. Rabbit bitch. Well, she's right, Henry. The law is clear. The girl's a thief. Did you hear anything? Did you hear any children? No. No, I did not. Could there be children there? Henry, our objectives are clear and within sight. It would be a mistake to permit diversion. The violation of a child? Girl is right. There is God's law. Come to bed, Henry. Get some sleep. creation of a police force was clearly a Christian duty. It was needed not only to enforce the law, but also to protect the innocent. Three quarters of the city's children never saw their fifth birthday. Foundlings begged for survival or turned to crime or died of neglect. I needed to know if such children were indeed being unnaturally exploited in Mrs. Falkland's exclusive house. Under cover of accepting her offer of the previous day, I returned to the temples of Venus in the guise of a customer. What service do you require this time, Mr. Fielding? I wish to talk with you. Tea for one. You are a great man, Mr. Fielding, but still a man. There's no shame in that. Rest assured, Tom Jones alone ensures you a most reasonable price. <laughs> I can see why Lord Newcastle holds you in such high regard. <laughs> What encouraged you to turn from the world of letters to crime and punishment? Pecuniary hardship. I was barred from the stage, so I turned to the law. Uh, what encouraged you to turn 
here. Pecuniary hardship. That is a determination to avoid it. There are a few ways for a girl to exercise some control in her life. And I prefer this to being the other kind of mistress which I was for a while. <laughs> he chose to marry. But he was very rich. And he felt I deserved some compensation. <laughs> I understand the woman I met last night is your second wife. Yes, my first wife, Charlotte. She passed away. Hmm. She was your great love. According to my intelligence, this new wife gave birth to a child but three months after your nuptials prior to which she was your maid, Mr. Fielding. Your intelligence is correct. Do not misunderstand me, Mr. Fielding. In my position, it does me a little favour to bow before the petty moralities of the town and its scandals. Au contraire, I'm impressed. You ignored the wagging tongues of Grub Street in order that your child be not a bastardo. You regret the marriage? Sometimes. Mm. As you say, it was only for propriety's sake. Mm. Human beings, as we know, are weak, sinful creatures. Mm. Mm. All of us. However we decorate it, our instincts are base. Greed. Selfishness. Lust. Mara, your worship. Charged with the following list of robberies, all undertaken as part of the notorious gang of one Nicholas Mooney. On July the 12th, you did rob Mr. Benavir Abuthnot. Of 40 guineas. I never heard of Nicholas Mooney. Do you want to hang, Amara? To have your neck broken by a rope's noose? It's a rare thing that I offer to spare a man the gallows, and yet you rush towards martyrdom. I can't help you, sir. Assist me in the arrest and conviction of Mooney, and it will be his neck, not yours. Terrifying the man may be, but his vengeance cannot reach you from hell. We will protect you. flower of their womanhood, most charming. How do you find these charming girls? They come to me. It's their choice. I offer them a home, an education, and a trade. Do any of them take your fancy, or shall I show you the temple of mysteries? You said there are two temples, but the girl, Susanna White, she said she had a sister. A sister? Who knows what torment that child endured with a father who's a drunkard and a whore. 
or a sister. Uh, no, I, I have no doubt at all she's better off with you. There are young girls in my charge who receive instruction in reading and writing and decorum. When they reach 16... You are a businesswoman, Mrs. Falkland. I wish to do business. Because, as you see, I am ill. Rest assured, sir, of my discretion. Well, people think it merely gout or the ravages of time, but my ill health, as you would have guessed, is the fruit of sin. The normal treatment, salivation, its effects are too public for a man in my position. You need a child. Then, sir, it is our third temple which you require. It was true. The temples of Venus did indeed contain a secret third temple, where a man might be cured of syphilis by intercourse with a virgin child. Child has already spoken for Mr. Fielding. Perhaps I can outbid him. This this guy is perfect for your need. Eight summers, a virgin and a charming child. Betsy, come. Normally it'd be 50 guineas, but I offer her to you for 30. Do you wish to conclude? No. Delay is inadvisable. Your condition will only grow worse. I, 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 I need to bring the money. Oh, I think you can be trusted to honour your debts, Mr. Fielding. I have to get drunk. I understand. Your every need will be catered for. My present need, of course. Disgusts me. You are ill, sir, and in need of a remedy. You are very kind, Mrs. Borkler. Excuse me. Sister, I do see that bitch! Mr. Hargreaves. Your skivvy here claims. Mr. Fielding, once before we met in person at the little Haymarket Theatre. Ah, uh, I'm sure the honour was mine, so long as you weren't a critic. Mr. Hargreaves is the milliner from across the street. Mr. Fielding is inspecting my premises in his capacity as magistrate. And found nothing unlawful, I'm sure. <laughs> nothing unlawful. Mm. Uh, Mrs. Faulkner, perhaps we could conclude our business tomorrow evening. Good day, sir. Immense pleasure to have you as our guest, my lord. Your brother isn't here, I Ah, understand. indeed. No, no, indeed. Have we made further progress with this Mooney gang? 
But there is the one who will hang. Uh, as for the rest of them, until we are equipped, as we discussed. Yes. I've been pondering the subject of our discussions. I confess, in the light of day, the runners you request seem a less attractive proposition. A proposal better suited to European despotism than the free men of England. And our liberties are precious beyond life, are they not? Good. Good. For four years, we had lobbied Parliament for a police force, but were always obstructed by the apathy of the aristocracy, forever insulated from the worst violence by their armies of servants. Is the child there? Newcastle's changed his mind. His lordship's whim has deserted us. There will be no funds. And as the slug Omara fears Mooney more than us, we are damnable thwarted. It is a small thing, a single child, when so many are doomed. But we must save that child. Henry. But who shall offend against one of these little ones? It were better for him a millstone be hanged around his neck and he'd be drowned in the depths of the sea. It's monstrous indeed if it inspires you to quote scripture. It is monstrous indeed. But we're agreed, however, that the problem regarding Lord Newcastle requires the most urgent attention. Perhaps there's a way to satisfy both concerns. My half-brother John had lost his sight when he was 19 years old. But it had by no means blunted the sharpness of his mind. He was able to recognize no fewer than 3,000 street criminals by their voices alone, one of the many talents he was to bring to the challenge before us. He persuaded me that to combat Mrs. Falkland with her many influential patrons, the best approach was not necessarily the most direct. Mr. Hargreaves. It gives me great pleasure to see my work it does not wholly go to waste. Oh, I find your journal unparalleled useful, sir. Well, it might be yet more useful if space could be found to advertise the magnificence of your hat. In that case, Mr. Fielding, the gratitude would be immeasurable. Mrs. Fielding would sure look resplendent in such colors, or perhaps... Yes. I would offer a considerable concession, of course, to the author of Eurydice Hist, The Tragedy of Tragedies, and the Grub Street Opera. Oh, no, sir, I'm glad. <laughs> Were you regularly in attendance at the Haymarket? Oh, whenever I could, Mr. Fielding. And now, of course, I and my good wife consume your novels as if they were physical nourishment. Not again, my thanks. Now, this is excellent workmanship. It must be rather tiresome and uh, perhaps a little difficult when your clients are sluggish in the settling of their accounts. Does she owe a lot? Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to pry into your business affairs. Mrs. Falkland in no wise has caused me trouble, sir. Except financially. <laughs> Shall we? You think she can't pay? Or simply sees no reason to do so? I'm more of the opinion it is the latter. Dressmakers, cobblers, jewellers will tell a similar tale, whereas grocers and purveyors of liquor she pays every week. I'm so most anxious as to whether I shall be paid at all. Of course, to bailiffs is, of course, the prerogative of the creditor. Unfortunately, her bawdy house is already home from home for half the piss-proud gentry. The woman owes you money. 
the law is perfectly clear on the matter. She may have formidable friends, but I am the magistrate of Westminster and Middlesex. If you take your rightful, lawful action against her, you and your fellow merchants hereabouts, you will receive my unqualified support. The more so should your action occur around eight o'clock this evening. May I have another? Round up a few of your associates, Mr. Welsh. With your customary discretion. The key to ensuring Lord Newcastle's continued patronage lay with our colleague, Saunders Welsh. As High Constable of Holborn for six years, he had acquired a knowledge of London haunts which was unparalleled and essential if our dream of a London police force was ever to become reality. A night out at the Temples of Venus offered, by all accounts, a full service. Dinner, music, cards and dancing were in plentiful supply and always with the guarantee of fulfillment by the end of the evening. The last thing its wealthy patrons expected or desired was a rude interruption from the bailiffs. We sensed Lord Newcastle would have a particular aversion to it. And the removal of a debtor, in this case their mistress, might provide for Polly White and her like a glimmer of hope. the ability to save the girl. I don't much care. My foot pains me like a buckster. And it's only bailiffs. Nonetheless, it is most disagreeable. I don't know about you, but I have places I could be less likely to cause me indigestion. of the moon. 
Welsh, John, and two companions. Oh, I know. I can tell Welsh from the sound of his boots. You need to soak that foot. I'll boil some water. Oh, later. Uh, this is Bill Pentelow, former constable, less bent than most. Went 20 rounds with Mr. Cribb, so not as sharp as he used to be. And this is Daniel Khan, fast as shit through a goose. If the pisspot thinks he don't need protection walking the streets at night, he's learned his lesson. What ought we do with his lordship's property, sir? We were thinking we might uh, return it to him as further demonstration of the merits of having runners. That would be somewhat incriminating, would it not? That depends how black-headed he is, sir, and I'd say considerable. <laughs> how much money is there? Uh, maybe six guineas in the purse, and the coat is worth a few shillings. Is six guineas the full content of the purse? I swear to God, sir. All of us have pilfered a halfpenny. I can guarantee the honesty of these fellows, Mr. Fielding. If Mr. Welsh caught us lying, he'd thrash us till our own mothers wouldn't know us by sight. Good. Ah, the money will be useful. Ah, teach his lordship to have so much on his person in these dangerous times. But burn the coat. After raiding their place of business, bailiffs would remove the debtor to a sponging house, a domestic dwelling serving as a temporary prison. It was a place where creditors squeezed their debtors of their last coin. But Mrs. Falkland, with her impressive list of patrons, had no intention of remaining there for long. On hearing of a lady in such distressful circumstances, it was the duty of a gentleman to pay her a visit. Mr. Fielding. I was outraged, madam, to hear of your misadventure. Seems that some of our neighbors are less than neighborly. <laughs> you are most kind. I gather from your continuing incarceration that at the present moment you're unable to discharge your debts. That is true, Mr. Fielding. Well, I wish I could help financially, but as you yourself pointed out, my office pays but poorly. Do you suppose your friends are looking for you? Of course. Request to the Earl of Sandwich that he pays his bill. <laughs> Requests from a, a, a friend in need for assistance. Oh, you regard them as your friends, your patrons. I wonder if already one of your whores hasn't usurped your position and taken control of your temples. I mean, why wouldn't they? And uh, I know a thing or two about patrons. Why <laughs> shouldn't the likes of Lord Newcastle, Earl of Coventry, oh, Viscount Queensbury, and um, yeah. <laughs> Viscount Falkland, whose name you so charmingly purloin. Why should they care which whore is in charge? My friends will find me. Well, the immediate question is, will they find you soon enough to prevent your removal to the fleet? Have you ever been in the fleet prison? Forgive me, Mr. Fielding, I am very tired, and your famous suite is lost on me this morning. Bride well, though, I imagine. Do as you will, Mr. Fielding, I can write more letters. Jane, both of us know you don't want to go back to prison. In truth, I admire you. To survive bride well, you must have sold your cunt, your mouth, and your ass for bread. And you were lucky enough to get out without the pox, and lo, like a phoenix, you are Mrs. Falkland, the consort and favorite of lords. Magnificent. What is it you want? You poor soaked son of a bitch. The girl, Susanna White, and her sister, Polly. You will release them from servitude and obligation, with or without the clothes you haven't paid for yet. What will you do with a child, Polly? Keep her locked away? I know you, Fielding. Men like you. Is that so? 
Oh, madam, I'm sick and a virgin is a medical urgency. Such a transparent lie. Truth is, only the freshest flesh can quench your abominable lusts. Your pretty wife, uh, an aged hag, already spoiled by childbirth, unable to satisfy your lusts. She's too loose. You're a formidable woman, Mrs. Falkland. Formidable, as the French say, and you have even more formidable friends. I am but a lowly magistrate, but consider this before you think to enact your swift revenge. My office may lack a certain authority, but I, too, am very clever. Very well. Consider it done. This. I just thought to tell your brother a bit. He was assaulted by ruffians. He stole his coat and his purse. Good Lord. Neither of you heard about it? Not a word, my Lord. It was your Mooney gang. I fought them, of course, and gave them bloody noses. Mr. Fielding, it was dreadful. They attacked me with clubs and were terrifying masks as if they were the minions of Satan himself. Thank God you survived to tell the tale. Thank God indeed. I have to confess, this brush with brigandry has reinforced my commitment to your cause. I shall be proposing your bill, Mr. Fielding. Parliament, I'm sure, will agree to a small force of men to assist you. In years to come, I promise you, no one will believe this city existed without police. You can apprehend these hellhounds. You'll show them no leniency, Fielding. I want that understood. They'll be publicly hanged at Tyburn with a crowd cheering. There's a shit ass. Blackguards' necks are stretched and snap. We will do everything possible to bring these men to justice. Indeed. Of course, nobody wishes this to be spoken of openly. You will have your runners under your command at Number Four Bow Street, but for now, there'll be a secret. Uh, whatever's best in the judgment of Parliament, my lord. In September of 1753, Parliament voted us but 200 of the 500 pounds we requested. It was not enough, but it was a beginning. My sister knows the way from down here, sir. There's no life for me selling fruit, Mr. Welch. I wanted to know my sister was out of harm's way, and there she is. I wonder if I could ask you one last act of kindness, though. You'd see to it she gets safely back to my father. And after, would you, would you tell Mr Fielding that I'm sorry? My words to him were harsh and... we are forever in his debt. Of course. This is quite the most ungrateful bitch I have ever met. <laughs> but I leave the decision to you. If you still want to fuck her, she can stay. Oh, I still want to fuck her. Uh, A splendid fellow. A gambler and a fornicator. A fuckster. A voice among the powerful. Our friend. Our friend. Human beings. Creatures of the basest instincts. 
I never thought differently. Animal passions. Chaos. Hell itself. We need order. We need the law. And finally, we can give London what it needs. He began to tackle the city's wave of crime with six constables. All, like Mr. Welsh, master craftsmen with their fists. We soon became known as the Bow Street Runners. When tensions increased and the gang wars escalated, we were ready to meet that challenge head on, fire with fire. Those we arrested were subject to the full weight of the law. Justice had to be seen to be done. We would combat crime street by street. We would create a force worthy of the name. We would purge this city of vice. <laughs> 